So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here to give a talk and also hear all the interesting presentations. So today we'll talk about the neural representation supporting PET integration. So there were already some mentions of PET integration in the meeting. So it's a simple form of navigation in which uh, <clears throat> an animal use cues, for example, from the vestibular system to know where it is in space. For example, it can integrate its direction and speed or distance travel. And you create some vectors of this type. And if you sum them, you can do, use that to know where you are in space. And there you really use internal cues in, instead of using uh, landmarks, for example. Uh, I guess in recent years, the focus of path integration in, has been really grid cells. So, People think that grid cells are important for path integration. There are considerable evidence for this. Uh, first of all, just their firing rate. If you think, if you take the point of view of a grid cell network, so for or grid cells, so to know when it's time to fire, the cell needs to have access to how far an animal has moved and in which direction, or at least the network has to have that information. And that's exactly the same type of information that you need to. Uh, calculate to do path integration. These cells are seen also in completely new environments. So the grid pattern is there. It's also present if you switch off the light for uh, some extent of time. So depending on the condition exactly. Uh, manipulations that affect grid cells also affect uh, path integrations. And finally, grid cell like uh, representation in humans are correlated to uh, path integration. So there's considerable evidence linking grid cells to path integration. However, it's probably not the only cell type involved in path integration. So we can go back in time a little bit to the 90s and early 2000. People have used uh, here a homing test to study path integration and they did lesions of different brain areas. So briefly on this task, the animal starts at the refuge cage uh, and it climbs on the arena and there are different food wells on the table. So the food well would be at one of these, uh, the food well, the food reward would be at one of those food wells. So the animal goes around, try to find that food. And it's usually a large uh, pieces of food. So the animal is not eating it there. It carries it back to the refuge. And when the animal perform this in darkness, it is thought that it integrates its path on the search uh, path or search journey. And once the food is kept, it can use path integration to know how to come back to the refuge. I won't go too much into the details of these studies, but just here, a summary table, you can see that uh, lesions, different brain areas have an uh, impact on uh, path integration. For instance, lesions of the hippocampus or transection of the fornix impaired uh, path integration spinal cortex also important, obviously the vestibular system, the medial entorhinal cortex and parietal cortex. Not so much the lateral entorhinal cortex. But you can see that there's a large network that is probably important for this type of navigation. Uh, yeah. So in this field, I think what is currently missing is to do more recordings during a path integration. So this has been challenging and indeed like what we know about grid cells, for instance, or play cells is mainly uh, from random foraging uh, in open field. So there's a need for more recording in actual path integration tasks. And there has been some great uh, progress in that uh, side of things. So mainly from studies done in VR and uh, from the group of Matt Nolan, for instance, or Lisa Giacomo that are gonna uh, present a little bit later today. Uh, but however, in freely moving animals, there's not, uh, there hasn't been so many studies. So there's a study of head direction cells from the Taube lab here. But apart from that, we really don't know how the place cells or grid cells or firing when an animal is doing a homing task using path integration. And the main reason I think why there hasn't been so much progress there is that the current path integration task for freely moving animal. So when you perform, when an animal perform them, they're associated with very poor spatial coverage. So the animal typically doesn't explore much the environment. 
So it's very difficult to characterize the neurons. There are only a few trials a day, so you don't get so much data. And they also require the experimenter to went off in quite a lot. So we basically, in our project here, we try to develop a test that would overcome these difficulties. And in the second time, we try to look at the hippocampal representation in animals performing on the path integration task. So first, the behavioral paradigms that we develop. So what we wanted as feature is a task in which we could record at least 100 of trial of day. <clears throat> Animal would explore a large area so that it was possible to look at firing fields, for example, in play cells. Uh, it would ideally require minimum interventions of the experimenter, and also we would have control of visual cues, auditory cues, and olfactory cues. So here's uh, what we came up with. So it's basically started as a Skinner box, but we basically took the lever out of the Skinner box and placed it on the arena. And the task goes as follows. So the animal starts in the home base, it then goes out to an arena and it finds there a lever and pressing the levers will lead to a food uh, delivery here. So the animal goes out, search for the lever, press the lever, and then head back to the food magazine to receive a food reward. Um, yeah. So here's the first video to show you how it looks like. So we call the task Autopy for automated path integration. They are light trials. So that's an example when the animal can see. So obviously it goes straight to the lever and back to the home base. So here in slow motion, how it looks. So the animal goes out, presses the lever and then head back. You will see here. So there's a food deliver in the home base and then it goes to the next trial. So between trials, the arena is rotated to make sure that the animal doesn't use uh, orders on the arena. And then this is a trial in complete darkness. So there the animal cannot find the lever directly. It needs to explore a little bit more. And in this case, it finally found the lever and returned to the home base with uh, small errors. There's a second video just to show you how we quantify this. So that's again, a light trial. So we have a camera from the top of uh, the arena. So we can track the animal with a deep lab cut. And you can see we have an angle uh, where the animal returned to the periphery after pressing the lever. So that's in complete darkness. I hope you can see that the animal makes small mistakes and then try to find out where the home base is and then finally find, found its way back. And there's a last uh, dark trial is just to show you that sometimes the animal would perform several journeys during a trial. So that would be an incomplete journey if you want. The animal went out and did not press the lever. And there the animal will go out again and there press the lever and then try to head back home again with some degrees of error in darkness. And between the trial, the lever can also move. So it's fully automated uh, lever. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. So we have different controls during the task. So as I said, we can rotate the arena between trials. Uh, the location of the lever has changed between trials. So it means that every search is kind of unique. We have a white noise to prevent the animal from using other auditory cues to navigate. It's under infrared uh, illumination. So in dark trial, there's no other source of light in the room and there's no actually human in the room. So it's all monitor from a different room. Uh, this is to give you an idea. So that's a recording session. Uh, we have plotted the trials. So here, the light trials. So these are trial with the lights on and dark trials. So this is in complete darkness. So you can first see the animal tend to go directly to the lever when the lights are on. So the animal sees the lever and approach it. In darkness, it's a much more varied behavior. So the animal really needs to search to find the lever and also to come home. Example of single trial. So again, they can have several journeys and here they are plot in different colors. And in darkness, several journeys are made just to find the lever. So overall, the probability of finding the lever on a journey is uh, lower in darkness. Sorry, the legend is not here, but uh, the blue, dark blue is uh, dark trials and yellowish is a uh, light trial. So the probability of finding the lever is lower in darkness 
But once they reach the lever, then pressing the lever has the same probability between the two trials. So the task, the animal still knows the task in darkness. Now here we look at the search behavior during the light condition and the dark condition on the right. So you can see the search in light condition is much more direct. In darkness, you have more varied behavior. If we look at the path length, the duration or the speed, it's very different, especially the speed. So you have much higher speed in the light condition. A similar phenomenon is seen if we look at the homing path. So it's much more direct in when the lights are on compared to darkness. And again, you can see that the length or duration and speed is different between the two conditions. Now to the homing accuracy. So it, Homing in the light obviously is rather straightforward. So the animal sees the home base, so it can go back directly. In darkness, you see that in general, it tends to be in the right direction, but there's uh, more variability between uh, trials. And so uh, we can quantify that here with error at periphery. So where is the where does the animal reach periphery? And there's larger angles in darkness. Now we wanted to see, so is the complexity of the search path in, uh, leading to more errors in the behavior as evidence of error accumulation? And that is a typical characteristic of path integration. So here we have in blue the search path of the animal. And this is just to uh, explain you this idea of error accumulation. So when the search is direct, then homing is very accurate. And then if we go to the other extreme here, when the search is very long and complex, then homing would be worse. So is it the case? So we quantify the trials we had. And indeed, we see correlation between the time to reach the uh, at lever, sorry, the length of the search path, the duration of the search path, and the deviation to the lever. Uh, so basically, this all correlates with the error in homing back to the, to the home base. And we can see here correlations for the different variables with uh, error. And importantly, so during the light trial, this correlation, these correlations are not as strong. So it seems that the animal depends on path integration mainly in, uh, for dark trials. So this brings me to the first conclusion of the talk. So the mice can learn to navigate to and press a lever in order to get a food reward in their home base. Uh, after a relatively short path in darkness, homing is less accurate uh, than when the visual landmarks are present, which uh, fit well with some data that we have on grid cells, actually, that they accumulate error in darkness relatively fast or quickly. And we also found that mice can perform up to 150 trials in the single session, and they explore most of the arena, at least in dark, during dark trials. So it's suitable for recording. And uh, that brings me to the second part of the talk where we indeed look at the spatial representation in the hippocampus during uh, path integration. So we're exactly the same task. Uh, the main questions we ask, so does performing the path integration task lead to remapping in the hippocampus? Are hippocampal neurons more tuned to head direction or direction of movement during the task? And are some fields somehow anchored to the lever? Uh, the paradigm we use is uh, shown here. So first, the animal did a random foraging task, so to have a control situation, like the typical recording of play cells. So that was for 30 minutes, not 20. Then there was a rest period, and then we performed the autopy task. So there, during this task, they were light and dark trials. Now we did a recording from the CA1 brain region using silicon probes and we basically use the firing rate, the spike waveform, and the spike time autocorrelation to cluster cells in uh, two groups, may putatively interneurons and pyramidal cells. And you can see the pyramidal cells have much lower firing rate than interneurons. Um, yeah, so I'm showing here recording from during uh, the open field. So I, maybe I'll just show you here the scheme. So OF1, it means open field the first 10 minutes. OF2, the second 10 minutes in the open field. Light refers to the autopy task, the light trials, and dark, the dark trials of the autopy task. So that will come back in a few uh, sec uh, slides. So first, you can see these cells have 
uh, stable firing fields, as you would expect in random foraging. And during the light and dark trials, these fields seem to have moved. That's uh, interesting. I should have mentioned also that the arena is exactly at the same location. So the task, uh, so the open field trials and the task, the arena is exactly in the same place in the room. So we get remapping despite of this. Uh, and sometimes we have fields in light and dark. Sometimes the fields are not so easy to see. Uh, yeah. So if we try to quantify that, so the rate of the neurons is uh, more or less similar between the different brain, uh, different uh, conditions. So the open field, the light trials and dark trials. If there's something that seems to be higher in formation score during uh, the task, if we look at map similarity, so to know what are the map or stable between conditions. So if we look first and second uh, 10 minutes in the open field, so it's highly stable. However, if we compare light and dark trial, this goes almost to zero, slightly above. And then between the light and open field or dark trials and open field, then the correlation is really low. So there seem to be some remapping in the hippocampus between the condition. Now we try to confirm that using a measure that doesn't depend on the firing rate map. So we basically use the instantaneous firing rate of neurons in time. And then we can correlate the instantaneous firing rate of two neurons, so pairs of neurons, and see what are these firing associations are stable across conditions. For instance, here in the first and second open field uh, trial, you see that there's no remapping. So the firing association remains the same. If we compare uh, open field with light trials, then that goes down uh, significantly. Same thing for open field to dark trial. And like dark trials is somehow higher. So there seem to be almost complete remapping between the task and the open field. And there's some degree of remapping between light and dark. So perhaps partial remapping. Now it seems that the, also the directionality of the firing field during the task is increased. So again, we have three maps, so the open field, the light trials and dark trials. And if we look here, this is the firing rate as the function of head direction. So there seem to be higher firing rate or more directionality during the task. And we can quantify that for all the pyramidal cells we have. And you can see the vector length here is a measure of how directional the, these uh, cells are. And it's increased during the task compared to uh, the open field uh, trial. And again, we can do similarity of the tuning curves and it's highest in the open field despite having less selectivity. And then in the other condition, it goes down close to zero. Uh, we did another analysis to try to understand so how, so are the firing fields of places really directional? So what we see here are maps, but only when the animal is running towards the north, so with 45 degree uh, of range, or south. And you can see here during the light trials, this cell had a clear firing field that is absent when the animal is running back to the home base. So it's only seen during the search phase, basically, this uh, field. Uh, yeah, and we can basically quantify the correlation between these directional map and again, in open field it's correlated. However, because the fields are directional, then that goes down during light and dark trials. Now, the last thing I would like to present today is that we were surprised in some cells. So if we look at this map here during the task, the firing fields are very not obvious. So it looks like this neuron is starts to fire, firing everywhere. And, but we reason, so it might be that these cells are actually like related to the liver position. So I plotted here, that's the position of the liver in the light and dark trial. So you see it varies from trial to trial. And now we basically created firing rate maps that are locked on the position of the liver. And what you can see is, for example, this neuron here in darkness has a clear field just uh, north to the liver. So this cell seems to be basically locked to the liver. And we have other examples of these cells, perhaps this one. So you can see here the field is not so obvious. But if you create a map that is center on the liver, it becomes really obvious that that neuron files just next to the liver. And we found other 
many of these neurons. Uh, okay, so this uh, brings me for to the conclusions for today. So different representation in the hippocampus are active during the pattern integration test compared to those activated during random foraging. Also relying on different stimuli for navigation, for example, using visual landmark during the light trial or uh, perhaps more uh, idiotetic cue during dark trials cause a partial remapping in the hippocampus. We also found that firing fields in the hippocampus are more directional during the autopy task and some of them become anchored to the liver during the autopy task. And it could be that hippocampal representation during path integration incorporate key trials events, for example, the search path or the homing path or behavior at the liver. So we'll need to explore that more in detail, but uh, that's it for today. I would like to thank uh, Mariam Najafiam Jazzy. So she's a PhD student that has been working very hard on this project and also the funding bodies for this project. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Kevin, for an um, interesting talk. Um, so there are some questions on the, the chat window, not in the Q&A. Uh, if you can, please um, try to use Q&A so that people can vote. Nevertheless, I can read those questions, I think. So there is a question from David Reddish. Remapping is often based on goal distributions, which are completely different in your random foraging and auto PI tasks. It's more like a comment. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> no, indeed. So uh, I guess in random foraging, the food is directly delivered on the arena versus during our task, uh, the animal goes out to the arena and never doesn't receive any reward on the arena. So yeah, I mean, there are many variables that are different between random foraging and the task. So uh, the behavior also is much more directional. So especially during light trials compared to the random foraging. Uh, yeah, so there could be many factors that explain why there's a remapping there. Yeah. And there was also one comment from Mark Randall. Uh, have you had a close look at the activity right after the animal pressed the river? I'm wondering if there is a forward sweep of activity akin to replay theta sequences that would provide a homing vector to guide behavior back to the refuge. That's very good idea. Thank you. <laughs> we haven't done that. So uh, like a lot of the analysis we actually did in the last few days leading to that uh, meeting, but indeed it's a very good uh, idea. So when the animals at the liver and there's probably that's where the animal kind of decided on a direction in many trials. So it would be indeed a key moment during the task to look at activity. I don't know if we see like sharp poise. I would doubt it from just the behavior of the animal. So that happens relatively, like it doesn't pause there so much as uh, usually it turns around the liver and presses and go away. But still it could be that they are almost as active there and they predict the path of the animal. Yeah. All right, I think Matthew had a question, right? Yeah, hi, Kevin. Um... Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, so you showed that the error was greater in the dark when the search path was longer. Did you look at whether this was best explained by time or by distance? We did not uh, try to decouple them at the moment. That's, yeah, that could be interesting. I guess you guys with the virtual uh, setups have a very nice, <laughs> possibility to dissociate that sometimes. Maybe, maybe you could do it. If the run speed varies from trial to trial, you might be able yeah. to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we haven't tried so far, yeah. All right, um, so this is a new question from David Reddish. 
even if path integration is extra hippocampal, hippocampal place fields would change. Give, given the theory that hippocampus plays a role in rest, uh, re resetting the path integrator, have you seen map changes at localizing events? Map changing at look. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand. Can you <laughs> do I see the oh, okay? I see the question. All right. Yeah, as a resetting, it's a good question. We haven't looked at this. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think how one would look at this. <laughs> but we we still have a lot to do. For instance, we have not analyzed, for example, trials where there's more error, less error. Uh, that has not been done yet. So, yeah. OK, uh, there is another question. What creates multiple journeys in light condition? What creates multiple journeys? Oh, so that's mainly the animal going to the liver. And typically, it would do a turn around it, but doesn't press the lever. So uh, yeah. Or it could also be that, for example, the animal, I don't know, start exploring one wall of the room, for example. So just stop doing the task uh, for a brief moment or something like this. But most of them, I think, are behavior where the animal goes to the lever, uh, but fails to press the lever itself. All right. Oh, another question. Given that an outbound journey is in the dark, the mice do not know where the liver is. Is the is the place field location anchored to the previous location or to the start box or neither? Um, I so we haven't checked this exactly. But uh, in some experiments, uh, only behavioral experiments, we try to do some sort of, uh, so doing two trials, for example, with the same lever position and see if the performance was much better. And we did not see much improvement, at least in the small experiment we did. So that would kind of tell me perhaps they are not coding the previous location of the lever in darkness. But we have not uh, looked at it also. Yeah. All right. I think it's about time. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on to the second speaker, um, Professor Lisa Giacomo from Stanford University. Her talk is entitled Multiple Maps for Navigation. Um, yeah, I know Lisa from the time at the Boston University. After that, she um, conducted her postdoc in uh, Moja Lab. In, um, and, and then uh, right now, he, she's a professor at Stanford University doing very interesting uh, studies. So I wanted to um, invite her. And finally, it's possible. So I'm excited. Um, yeah, Lisa, floor is yours. Great, thanks Motoharo, and thank you for the um, invitation to speak today. Um, so my lab studies uh, our sense of space and what I wanna tell you about today are two stories um, that uh, in which we've tried to understand how experience and uh, an animal's internal behavioral state can influence this sense of space. Um, so I'm sure as many of you know that decades of research have indicated that the same brain regions that are really critical for memory are also critical for our sense of location. And, you know, the real classic example of this is, you know, the ability to park your car in a parking lot, go into a store or to work, and then later navigate back to um, your uh, parked car. And so you have to not only have a memory of where you actually parked your car, but as you um, move towards your car, you have to be able to accurately um, navigate towards that um, intended goal location. And in order to do this, you know, what your brain really needs is some sort of internal neural map of your external spatial world. Um, and you need this to not only know where you're currently located, but to uh, remember where you've been and to subsequently plan where you might want to go next. 
Uh, and in order to build this map, our brain has to integrate a number of highly complex cues. Um, for example, landmarks in the world, our relationship to those landmarks, as well as the landmarks relationship to each other, the direction that we're traveling, um, are we moving towards or away from our car, and the distance that we've actually traveled along our intended goal trajectory. Um, we now know that many of the substrates that are needed to build this internal map of space exist in two brain regions, the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus. Um, the first of these cells are grid cells, which I'm sure you've heard a little bit about um, over the course of, of, or you'll hear about over the course of today. And um, this is just an example of a grid cell. It's a, um, what you're looking at here is just the bird's eye view of a grid cell firing pattern after a mouse has explored a one by one meter open arena where blue colors indicate locations where the cell was not active. And these red and yellow colors indicate locations where the cell was highly active. And you can see even just by eye that in many ways, this pattern is reminiscent of a longitude and latitude coordinate system. Um, only instead of a square grid covering a map, which is what we're used to looking at, say on Google Maps, the unit of the grid is an equilateral triangle. Um, grid cells have two particular features that make them really well suited to encode the position of the animal. The first is that they um, have different spatial phases. So this is an example just illustrating that where you have two grid cells that have the same underlying geometric pattern, the same spatial distance between their firing nodes, but they're actually shifted in terms of where they're located in space. So no matter where you are in space, um, at least a subset of your grid cells are active. And the second feature is that grid cells come in different spatial resolutions. So this is the sagittal slice of a mouse brain. This is the hippocampus here and the entorhinal cortex is this long skinny structure in the back. And if you look at dorsal and toronal cortex, you have grid cells with small spacing or distances between their firing nodes, say 20 or 30 centimeters. And as you move to more ventral locations, you have grid cells with larger, um, larger spacing. So there's more distance between their firing nodes. Uh, and in the very ventral tip, you get, you can, these can get up to um, several meters. Uh, grid cells coexist with several other cell types that are defined based on their firing patterns observed when animals navigate through space. Border cells um, fire only when the animal is near an environmental boundary and object vector cells fire at a particular distance and direction from an object in the world. And these cells are thought to provide information about landmarks and boundaries in the world. Head direction cells fire only when the animal faces one particular direction, for example, the northeast direction, and are thought to provide a type of um, locally referenced internal neural compass. And then speed cells change their firing rate here on the y-axis with the running speed of the animal here on the x-axis and are thought to provide a type of neural speedometer. These um, neurons together then are thought to provide um, or are thought to support behaviors like path integration, which you just heard about in Kevin's um, uh, previous um, talk, as well as support or provide um, information to place cells in the hippocampus, um, which are neurons that fire just in one particular place and are thought to provide the basis for autobiographical um, memory. So despite the re really fascinating physiology of this system, um, one of the unanswered, que unanswered questions we've been really interested in is how this neural map of space actually supports memory and navigation. And so what I wanna tell you about today are um, two works in which we've tried to start to address this question. So initial studies um, on how um, these neural maps support memory and navigation proposed a general dissociation between the roles of entorhinal cortex versus the hippocampus. Um, and the idea was that entorhinal cortex might contain codes for spatial position, orientation, and speed that might be a little bit less sensitive to non-metric cues, for example, the presence or absence of a reward in the environment. Um, whereas place cells would contain uh, would um, encode spatial position as well, but these cells might be a little bit more sensitive to non-metric cues, for example, the presence or absence of a reward in the environment. I um, mean, the general idea was then that you could attend four different concerts, say um, within the same concert hall, your play cells would provide a unique code or neural representation for each of these episodes, allowing you to form a new memory of each of these episodes, while your entorhinal cortex would provide a type of universal spatial mapping system that would allow you to flexibly navigate through this familiar environment, even though the content of the concerts differed. And just because I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a couple of slides um, to sort of specifically um, indicate what, what the idea is, is um, play cells would remap between each of these different concerts 
meaning that the spatial location of their firing field would move or change in its firing rate, whereas the grid cells would remain relatively static. However, if you went into a completely new environment, so you went to a new concert hall and attended a new or different type of concert, both your play cells and your grid cells would remap. So your play cells again would move the spatial position at which they're active in, or they might change their firing rate. And grid cells um, could potentially change in two different ways. Um, the first is that they could change in their orientation. So if you imagine here, for example, is our original grid cell pattern, and this is the pattern in the new environment, um, you can see that the tilt or orientation of the pattern has changed. And then the spacing might also change. The distance between these firing nodes uh, might increase or decrease between these two environments. And this would allow you then to encode this as a new episode and also have a different spatial map for navigating through this environment. Um, however, much of the initial work on grid cells, not all of it, but, but the vast majority of it really leveraged just a single behavioral paradigm. And that is that an animal would be placed into an open arena and it would randomly forage for um, scattered food rewards. However, we know that many ethologically relevant navigational strategies often employ behaviors such as goal-directed navigation to remembered reward locations. So many animals are often navigating back to a remembered home location or a remembered food location. I even navigate this way. I don't you know, randomly wander through California hoping Starbucks like falls on my lap. I navigate directly to a Starbucks. And so we were interested into, as to whether or not entorhinal neural codes might be influenced by tasks that integrate a remembered reward location. So to look at this question, we designed the following task. We had a black box and a white box. When the animal's in the black box, they're going to randomly forage for scattered food rewards. And when the animal's in the white box, they're going to switch between um, random foraging. And then when they hear an auditory tone, they can navigate back to a, an unmarked remembered reward location to receive a large food reward, an entire Cheerio rather than just these scattered, um, scattered Cheerios. Critically, we're going to um, compare all of our data in experimental animals, so animals that perform this spatial task, to a set of control animals that experience the black box and the white box, but don't actually change in what task they're um, performing. They just randomly forage in both of these boxes. And the other critical feature is that these boxes will be in the exact same spatial location. So after the animal um, explores the black box, we just lift it up and replace it with the white box. We're then going to look at the firing patterns of grid cells, border cells, head direction cells, and non-grid spatial cells, which are these sort of messy looking place cells that encode the position of the animal. So if we first consider grid cells, this is an example of three grid cells recorded across the two environments in which the animals are performing the task in environment two. And the first feature that we wanted to look at was just the spacing of the grid cells. So just as a reminder, that's the distance between these grid nodes. And what we found was that in our experimental animals, there was a small but significant decrease in grid spacing between environment one and, in, and environment two. But in our control animals, there was no significant change in grid spacing between the two environments. We then looked at orientation or the tilt of the grid pattern. And here we saw something even more striking. So in our control animals, we found very little change in grid orientation between the two environments as indicated by these gray bars near zero and 60 degrees. The grid pattern is repeating or repeats at 60 degrees. So this is essentially wrapping back around to zero. Whereas in our experimental animals, we found a number of grid cells that had sig significantly or substantially changed their orientation between the two environments. And so what this tells us is that despite the fact that these two environments share the same geometric environmental structure, they're in the same spatial position, we actually see um, signatures of contextual remapping in the presence of a task. It wasn't just grid cells, um, head direction cells were also changing. So this is an example of four head direction cells that um, changed their firing rate or orientation between the two environments in our experimental animals. Border cells were also, cha also changed between the two environments. This is a border cell, for example, that actually switched which wall it was most active on. This is a border cell that just changed its firing rate. And these non-grid spatial cells also showed a lot of features of remapping. Um, and they did, so, uh, they did so to a larger degree in our experimental animals compared to our control animals. <laughs> 
So we next wanted to ask whether or not Entorhinal Maps might restructure to incorporate the remembered reward location. So to do this, we looked at the firing rate of grid cells first, which is here on the y-axis, relative to the animal's distance from the reward zone on the x-axis. Here at zero, this is the closest the animal can be to the reward zone. And here at 100, this is the furthest it can be. And you can see that in environment two, there's an increase in firing rate near the reward zone compared to far from the reward zone. And we did a number of different analyses that revealed that this increase in firing rate was due to the fact that whatever grid nodes were closest to the remembered reward location in environment two were increasing their firing rate. And these um, grid nodes that were further from the reward location were either decreasing their firing rate or remaining unchanged in their firing rate. We saw the same thing in these non-grid spatial cells. Um, again, the, the um, firing rate increased near the reward location compared to far from the reward location. And this was due to sort of, sort of some heterogeneous changes. So for example, we saw cells that had a spatial firing field that moved closer to the reward location in environment two. This is another example of that here. Or we also saw cells that had um, very little spatial firing in environment one, but then formed a field around or over the reward location in environment two. Finally, we asked whether or not these task associated changes in entorhinal codes might impact navigation. And to do this, we looked at um, times where we had simultaneously recorded several, um, so, uh, a high number of cells. So, um, you know, something like 20 to 30 or 40, 50 cells. And from these sessions where we had these simultaneously recorded neurons, we would estimate the animal's position. And to do that, we trained a Bayesian decoder on position and speed match data between the two environments and looked at how, um, how much error we had in terms of how, um, or we looked at how well we could essentially decode the position of the animal. And here's the data for all of those sessions. You can see that in environment two, um, we can decode the position of the animal more accurately near the reward zone compared to far from the reward zone. And we can do so um, to a, we can have, or we have better decoding accuracy for that same position in environment two compared to environment one. And so this tells us that those localized firing rate changes that I showed you on the previous slide actually support spatial decoding at the remembered reward location. Um, so I've just shown you that you can get these changes in um, uh, you can get these changes in um, entorhinal representations with a change in task demands. Um, but many of the previous works, including our own in entorhinal cortex, had largely focused on dynamic coding properties of single neurons. And what I mean by that is we would look at the tuning curve of the single neuron in environment one and compare it to the, the tuning curve of that same number same neuron in a second condition, in our case, environment two. But many of the computational models that describe the emergence of particularly grid cells um, describe them as emerging from networks of recurrently connected cells. And so what that means is that the individual activity of any given cell in the network is not completely independent of the activity of its neighbors. And so we wanted to ask to what degree do, might you see these dynamic coding properties at the network level? Um, but one of the challenges in looking at this with some of our previous data sets is that the behavior is highly variable. So, um, you know, the animal rarely takes the same trajectory twice. The um, sessions are relatively short. They're usually 10 to 20 minutes long. And most critically, we only have a small number of neurons that are simultaneously recorded. I think our record was something around 60 um, in, you know, one kind of star rat. So to deal um, or address with both of these challenges, we turn to NeuroPixel's probe recordings and virtual reality. Virtual reality offers the benefit the, the animal um, is forced to essentially take the same trajectory many hundreds of times. And NeuroPixel probes recordings allow us to record from many more neurons simultaneously. So this is an example of a data set um, that we recently um, published in which you can see that in many cases we can record from over a hundred neurons at the same time from medial entorhinal cortex. Um, but in you know, a lot of these cases, we can record from over 200, 300, and sometimes even 400 neurons with just a single probe. And in addition, we still get nice um, spatially stable firing in the virtual reality using these probes. This is an example of six entorhinal cells that we recorded on a linear track the position of the animals on the x-axis, and each trial is stacked on top of each other on the y-axis, and you can see these cells all have nice spatially stable um, periods of firing. So using this approach, we wanted to ask whether or not entorhinal maps show flexibility or any kind of dynamic changes when the spatial and environmental context are invariant. 
And so we used um, one of two tracks, either what we called a Q rich track, which had five landmarks or a Q poor track, which just had two landmarks. It turned out it didn't actually matter which track we used for the results I'm going to show you, but we initially thought, um, thought it might. So we have two tracks. Um, and then uh, we had the animals perform a random foraging task. So when they walk down the track, there's a visual cue that appears that tells them where they can look for reward. And this allows us to dissociate the position of the animal with their running speed over the course of the entire session. And so using this task, we again get really nice spatial firing patterns. This is three individual neurons that we recorded using NeuroPixels probes. Um, each trial, uh, the firing rate rasters across trials is on top. And then this is the um, average um, firing rate tuning curve on the bottom. Um, but what you might notice is that what I'm showing you here is just 40 trials. And in fact, when we looked at the entire session, what we noticed is that there were these periods of time where we had a single stable spatial map, but there were also periods of time where we seemed to have a different single spatial um, stable map. And there were sometimes even times um, where the neurons got um, less organized or got a bit disorganized. We think they might actually be coding for distance traveled um, in these, these periods. Um, but regardless, this tells us that entorhinal neurons can dynamically vary their tuning properties despite the fact that the animals are in an invariant sensory context and performing the same behavioral task. Um, but this again, this is a single cell sort of example. Here I'm just showing three individual cells. What about if we look at the entire population? So to do this, we constructed trial by trial similarity matrices. So we're just looking at all of the activity on a single trial and correlating that with the activity of the same cells across other trials. And this is an example of three different sessions here. And this checkerboard like pattern essentially indicates that the entorhinal cortex is flip-flopping between multiple different stable spatial maps of space. You can see the same type of underlying structure here in these other two examples. It didn't, as I kind of mentioned on the previous slide, it didn't matter if this was a Q-poor or a Q-rich environment. We saw these same types of transitions between maps in both Q-rich and Q-poor environments. This is an animal that just ran in the Q-rich environment. And this is an animal that on, on different days um, ran in the Q-rich versus the Q-poor environment. I think the other thing you can probably see a little bit by eye is that um, the frequency and time between these different map transitions is actually quite heterogeneous across mice and sessions. So sort of the size of each of these blocks and the time at which each block persists varies quite substantially across these examples I'm showing you here. And so we then wanted to ask if remapping occurs without a change to the environment or um, uh, task, what factors might contribute to remapping? And so um, based on some of our previous work, we decided to look at running speed. Um, and so uh, this is an example of a trial by trial similarity matrix up here. And then on the bottom here is the running speed profile of the animal. And what we found was that just prior to one of these map transitions, we would see a dip in the running speed. And so here, this is just quantifying that for this individual session. You can see just prior to a remap, there's actually a lower running speed than when the map is stable. This is the second example here. And if we look at all of our mice in which we had at least two different um, maps of space, you can see that the average running speed tends to be slower just prior to a remap compared to when um, the map remains stable. So these population-wide remaps appear to be preceded by slower running speeds. So finally, to sort of um, get a better sense of why running speed might drive remapping, we collaborated with two theoretical neuroscientists at Stanford, Scott Linderman and Alex Williams, to characterize the geometry of the position coding. I um, mean, I just want to give you kind of um, a high level picture of what this analysis looks like and what it tells us. Um, so in this analysis, um, uh, the sort of class of computational models, um, attractor models, predict that the trajectory of network activity should trace out a 1D ring manifold when animals navigate through these linear environments. So if we imagine color coding each position of this, um, of this track and then looking at the activity of neurons in a lower dimensional space, we would expect to see a ring manifold in which the activity travels around this ring corresponding to the position of the animal on the track. And in fact, when we look at just a single map, so this is just one map in which uh, the entorhinal map doesn't change, that's exactly what we see. You can see this kind of ring manifold um, present. And when we look at um, a session in which there are two distinct maps, you can see there are two distinct ring manifolds. And what's actually happening is that during these remapping events, um, when we see these transitions between two different maps, the activity of the network is actually um, 
uh, jumping between these two ring manifolds. And that's what we're reading out as these sort of two different maps of space. So remapping then um, corresponds to a translation between these geometrically aligned ring attractors. And so what does this actually tell us about the data? Well, the first is that these ring attractors are highly aligned. So um, if we sort of stretch one and move it to see how much we need to do so in order to um, perfectly align them, we find that we have to do very little of that to have these perfectly aligned ring attractors. I mean, what that, tell, what that means is that any downstream decoder that really needs to decode the position of the animal can actually do so despite remapping as long as it's invariant to this um, dimension along which the manifolds are translating. And we actually showed that's the case in, in the experimental data as well. And the second is that um, when there is variability in network activity, this variability is preferentially oriented in the dimension that separates these two manifolds. And so what that means is that anything that increases network variability can predispose the network to remap. So finally, we wanted to look at whether or not slower running speeds might correlate then with an increase in variability. And so to do that, we looked at how close the neural activity was to the midpoint between the two manifolds. And this is just an example of two sessions in which we looked at that and found that the, um, the neural activity, um, the, the distance of the neural activity to this midpoint was lower when the animal's running slower and higher when the animal's running faster. And this is just another way to illustrate that where this is the slowest running speed data and the fastest running speed data. And you can see that the distance between these two um, sort of neural patterns is getting closer when the animal's running slow compared to when it's running fast. And so we sort of envision it in this way then where you have these two different maps of space and when, you're run, when the animal's running slow, this actually um, provides an opportunity for the system to remap in which the energy barrier for it to do so is lower. Whereas when the animal's running fast, it's harder for the system to remap. And so the network activity tends to stay in whatever map it's currently in. So just as a, um, a, a brief summary, um, remembered world locations can serve as a contextual cue capable of evoking different entorhinal maps of space. And entorhinal maps at the population level are capable of restructuring based on features of behavioral state. And we sort of imagine it as the following where, you know, you have an animal that has a, an environment it's very familiar with, it finds random food sources in this environment. But if there's um, a very large food source that suddenly becomes consistently available, it may actually be to the benefit of the animal to form a new map of the same spatial environment that potentially even encodes more information about that um, reward location. And just as sort of a reminder, you know, these entorhinal um, neural substrates um, at grid cells, border cells, head direction cells have been found in a wide variety of species. And so we think that entorhinal cortex and its ability to dynamically alter coding features um, to integrate different contextual features might be able to support the wide range of navigational strategies that different species employ. And finally, um, we think that understanding how entorhinal cortex can generate these multiple maps of space might provide insight into the principles by which, for example, the hippocampus segmates continuous experiences into discrete memory episodes. And so finally, I just wanna thank all of the folks that did the work. Um, Kia Hardcastle and Will Butler, um, both were a grad student and a postdoc in the lab that did the work on how remembered reward locations influence entorhinal maps of space. Malcolm Campbell did all the initial um, infrastructure along with Alex Attinger, postdoc in the lab to get the neural pixels set up. And then Isabel Lowe, graduate student in the lab, um, did the work that I described at the end for multiple maps in collaboration with Alex Williams and Scott Linderman. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge my funding sources and thank all of you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you for a very interesting talk. There are a couple of questions already coming. Uh, the first question, can you separate actual rate changes from increased uh, map stability in the area near the rewards? If the map is uh, jittery, far from landmarks, you will see effective uh, lower fire firing rates, uh, especially because you are uh, averaging over oh, averaging over the entire session. You, uh, your decoding data suggests that this is really a map stability issue. Yeah, no, um, I, you know, there certainly could be stability things that change as well. And the map is more stable near the reward location. Um, I mean, I think that would be a perfectly reasonable interpretation. 
Um, we did see the same firing rate changes when we just looked at single trajectories, but I think that would probably still be influenced as by like an underlying stability change. Um, we're trying to do the same task now in VR um, just to see if maybe um, having a little bit more control over the trajectory of the animal might um, allow us to look at some of those questions. And we're also um, now doing a, a similar task, but with some additional complexities um, using the neuropixels probes so that we can uh, have higher numbers of, of cells recorded at the same time, because that was really kind of a, a limiting factor in terms of what analyses we could do. Hi, there is a question with seven volts so from Kate Jeffrey. Uh, really beautiful data. Do you think these uh, state transitions are triggered by place of remapping in the hippocampus or vice versa or a mixture or neither? <laughs> um, yeah, great question, Kate. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would be shocked if the hippocampus isn't driving some of this. Um, I don't know that. I just, I just would be very surprised if it's not an active participant in, in some of these map switches. Um, we'd like to do some simultaneous recordings. We have NeuroPixels 2.0 now, which is the multi-shank probe, which is a little bit better for play cell recording. So that's one thing we'd really like to look at is whether or not these are occurring occurring simultaneously in the hippocampus, or if one is sort of leading, you know, by a millisecond <laughs> um, uh, from the other, or if, or if there are, you know, subsets of place cells that are participating in these remapping events and subsets that aren't. So um, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I, you know, I don't, at least right now, I don't have any data to kind of support um, one hypothesis over another. Yeah, another question from Antonio Reda. Do you think that reduced speed period might be also related to awake ripple in the hippocampus? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I suspect there's probably some interesting things that are going on in terms of um, like ripples um, or, you know, theta sequences or even, you know, kind of sequences that are present maybe when the animal's resting. Um, we haven't looked at that yet. We, uh, we would like to. We, we, um, I have a student in the lab that's trying to identify um, sequences in the data and see if we can look at some of those things. Um, in, in the mice, the, the like theta, theta and, and sharp wave activity isn't quite as robust as it is in the rat, but, um, but it's something that we're interested in looking at um, with the data set. All right. Um... And another new question from George Trangoy. Do you think that changes in the body position relate, relative to the head couple head could, could play a role in remapping? Um, I guess I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Um, yeah, I mean, in the VR, the body position doesn't really change relative to the head because the animal can't, um, but I'm sure there could be some, um, there could be some role for how the animal actually, um, explores the environment in, in the, um, environment one versus environment two. So, um, we're actually collaborating now with, um, uh, someone in Surya Ganguly's lab to look at whether or not sort of the statistics, um, the statistics of the animal's coverage and, and trajectories might play a role in what sort of entorhinal representations um, emerge. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Okay. I think it's about time. It's just about time. So thank you very much, Lisa. Great, thank you. It was great to have you. And uh, we move on to the third speaker of the second session, uh, Nikolai Axmaha. Sorry, <laughs> was the fourth speaker, Matthew Noran from the University of Edinburgh. His talk title is "Representation of Spatial Memory in the Medial Entorhinal Cortex." Um, could you um, try to? Yeah. So I wanted to um, invite Matt for a while. He's, uh, I think, he's one of the interesting lab where you know combining cellular studies in slice physiology like us. And, uh, and uh, very nice studies in spatial navigation at the same time. So very excited to have you. And I think you're ready. So that floor is yours. Hey, uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, Motohari, for the invitation. Um, it's been a really great 
conference so far. And also really great to see the innovation with Gather and um, we're all trying to reduce our carbon footprints. So hopefully things like this become more the norm in the future. Um, great, so I wanna to talk today about some work we've been doing, trying to figure out how um, neurons in the medial entorhinal cortex might represent um, memories of, of space or associations between space in general and important locations in particular. Um, so in, in general, when we think about spatial memories, sort of one um, sort of popular idea is that there's a sort of a hierarchy of, of brain circuits with the hippocampus sitting somewhere near the top and entorhinal cortex being involved in, in, in sort of making some kind of high order associations and interacting both with the hippocampus above and um, other cortical circuits uh, below. And it's pretty well established, I think, behaviorally that the medial entorhinal cortex is, is required both for um, storage and recall of spatial memories. And this really motivates the question of how is the medial entorhinal cortex doing this? And what are the kinds of neural codes that are important? Um, so the medial entorhinal cortex is a layered cortex. We know there are di distinct um, molecular cell types in each layer. And we know um, that, that also in a sort of open arena behavioral environment, um, Lisa already very nicely described these different uh, functional cell types. So the grid cells, uh, the border cells and the head direction cells, for example, as well as cells with less specific um, spatial firing fields. Um, now, as Lisa already pointed out, these cells are studied under conditions where there, there, there really is no behavioral contingency um, for the animal to really remember anything important. And a question is what happens when we change that, when we, when we start challenging animals to associate locations with, with rewards, for example. So um, Lisa's shown very nicely um, work that her, did, her group did, uh, and also at the same time, um, Charlotte Bukhara. Um, showing that the grid code and, and other spatial codes um, in the entorhinal cortex that represent space with these discrete firing fields that they can um, that the fields can restructure um, when animals learn about um, rewards in an environment. Um, from a purely theoretical perspective, um, there's also speculation from a number of um, studies that in order to translate this grid code into something that might be useful, um, to guide behavior where estimating distance and position is important, then having some kind of an analog readout where the, the, the grid code is perhaps translated into some sort of distance dependent rate code could be important. But, but today there hasn't really been a great deal of evidence for this um, kind of code. So I, I'll come back to this um, later in the, in, in the talk. So what we'd like to have then is a behavioral task where we can investigate um, roles of medial entorhinal cortex in spatial memory I'll describe this in the first part of my talk. And then in the second part, I'll talk about some of the neural codes that we find uh, during this task. Um, so what we wanted um, when we were setting this up is, is really a task where we can challenge animals to associate um, a reward with a particular location and where we can obtain many trials um, in a behavioral session, uh, allowing us to do quantitative behavior um, as well as physiology. And, and, and so what we've come up with is a, is a virtual task where the mouse runs down a virtual track and um, we train the mouse that it can stop at a reward at, at a particular zone, which on these trials here is marked by these um, clear changes in the track pattern. And when it does so, it receives a reward. So clearly the mouse could um, solve this task simply by associating the bars um, with the reward. But what we can do very easily because this is a virtual um, task is we can remove the bars and we can ask if the, if the mouse can still stop at the right location, which, which hopefully you saw on, on that final trial that it did. So here there are no unique location cues. So if the mouse is going to solve this task, it has to remember the location of the reward and it, and it has to use or adopt a sort of path integration like strategy in, in order to be able to stop at the correct um, location. Now this is a linear track, so clearly we're not able to test angular path integration here, but rather we can test the distance estimation component. So um, this is what the behavior looks like in the task. A naive mouse will typically stop um, 
um, at, at, at random along the track. Um, it, it will learn that it can receive a reward if it stops uh, at the reward zone location. And with training, what starts to happen is that the mice develop a spatially selective uh, stopping strategy. So they begin stopping um, in anticipation of or, or, or just inside the, the reward zone to receive a reward. Now, the critical test um, for us is if we want to test um, path integration um, dependent uh, memory, then what, then what happens when we remove the queue? And it, it turns out that the mice are able to adopt a, a path integration like strategy um, in order to um, obtain rewards. So here we call these non-beacon trials where the queue is absent, but the um, mouse is still rewarded. And here we call these probe trials where there is no reward. And you see that the mouse typically samples the region of the reward zone um, but, but before continuing to initiate the next um, trial. So um, if we follow um, the behavior over, over, over days of training, um, here what we're plotting is the distance at which the mouse first stops on the track. So as the mouse becomes familiar with the task, this distance increases as it begins to stop um, just in anticipation of the reward zone. And this is true on beacon trials, on the non-beacon trials, and on the probe trials, which are introduced um, after the mice reach a performance criterion. So we have then a, a learned behavior in, in which mice are learning um, the importance of a particular location on a track, and it's a task that they can solve with a path integration strategy. Now, um, there's lots of questions that we've been asking with this task. One is which cell types are important to solve the task? And this is um, a simple initial experiment where we've expressed um, tetanus toxin light chain or green fluorescent protein in stellate cells in layer two of the medial enterorhinal cortex. Now tetanus toxin light chain blocks release of neurotransmitters. So effectively what we're doing here is taking the stellate cells out of the, the, the circuit and, and making them unable to influence downstream neurons. And when we did this experiment, it, it turned out we had um, a number of mice that had very extensive expression of um, the tetanus toxin light chain. Others, just simply because of um, experimental variability, the expression was not so extensive. And, and so we've been able to subgroup these mice and, and look also to see if there's a sort of dose, dose dependent effect of the um, tetanus toxin expression. And essentially, what we find is that um, a high expression of tetanus toxin. Um, strongly impairs performance both on, on the beacon trials, such that the animals don't reach the criterion for, for, for doing probe trials. Intermediate expression also impairs performance on the beacon trials, and we see a performance impairment on the probe trials. So suggesting then that we require, um, or, or the animals require, um, a, a, an intact population of stellate cells in order to solve the task. Um, now, the animals are still able, even though they're, they're not able to localize very well uh, when the stellate cells are inactivated, they're still able to modify their behavior to, to improve their performance on the task. And one way we see this is by looking at how running speed in this black box area at the, at the start and end of the track changes and running speed increases in, in each group of animals. So this sort of non-specific, non-spatially specific change in behavior is maintained um, when we, when we um, inactivate the stellate cells. So what we have then is a um, behavioral task where we can evaluate um, two forms of memory, a, 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 a cue-dependent association um, of a location with reward and a, a path integration dependent uh, form of memory. And this is a learned behavior and it, it, it requires at least the stellate cells in the superficial enteronal cortex. So what then are the neurons in the enteronal cortex doing during this task. Um, what I want to sort of step back and just sort of think about a little bit is the types of code that they might be using. So um, there's much data uh, from the hippocampus, enteronal cortex and other retrohippocampal areas showing that the use of a sort of a discrete code, so the pl a place representation or a grid representation. But we also know that in other brain areas, a sort of a more analog kind of code can also be useful for representing place. And, and what I'm going to show you is that, um, or evidence that some of the neurons in the enterorhinal cortex um, may in fact be using this type of analog code in, in, in a, what we think is an interesting way. Um, and I, I already alluded to that this can be sort of motivated 
um, by sort of theoretical work suggesting that this type of code might be useful um, for, for transport, transforming a, a grid representation into something useful for guiding behaviors. So um, the experimental setup is, is very straightforward. These are tetrode recordings from animals uh, performing the task with uh, micro CT based localization after the task. And the recording population that I'm going to talk about includes both medial interrhinal cortex and also some recordings from pre and parasubiculum. So um, we don't see any striking differences uh, between areas. So we've, we, we've pooled all this data um, together. And here then is what we see when we look at individual units. There are many new units, um, as Lisa's already showed, that have sort of discrete like um, firing fields of various forms along the track. But what we also found, which really has intrigued us, are um, neurons that show a, a ramp-like change in, in, in firing rate as a, as a function of position. And these are the neurons that I want to focus on for the remainder of um, this talk. Um, so um, first of all, um, this ramp-like firing is something that's fairly common. Um, this is uh, this is a um, this is the behavior. So the stopping behavior of a well-trained mouse, um, um, with individual stops, the average stops, and then the running speed, which are, of course reduces as the animal approaches the reward zone. And, and, and here are three simultaneously recorded cells, all of which show some form of ramping activity. Um, but hopefully, also you notice that actually the the trajectory of the ramp um, is is different between each each cell. So. The, the, there are multiple different sort of stereotypical trajectories that we think that the, 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 the ramping activity can take. So here are now sort of what we, we might consider as examples of um, some of the activity profiles we see most often. Um, one profile is a, is a ramping trajectory with a positive slope that resets in the reward zone and then has a positive slope again on the second part of the track. Another trajectory um, is, is, is ramping up towards the reward zone and then down again after the reward zone. Um, a third trajectory is a negative slope ramp um, that resets again at the reward zone. And a, a, a fourth trajectory is a ramping down to the reward zone and then back up um, following the reward zone. Um, so these are exemplar neurons. Um, here are the population averages for, 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 for each group of neurons. And here are all the neurons that we we might categorize as ramping, just shown as a, a, as, as a raster plot, really to hopefully um, illustrate the diversity um, that this ramping activity takes, but also the consistency um, from cell to cell. And I think what's really interesting to highlight here is how consistently um, the ramping activity resets in this region of the reward zone, whichever um, group of neurons um, one is recording from. So there are many questions that we, we, we might have about this activity. One is, does it represent space or, or, or position on the track or, or, or does it perhaps encode um, movement speed or acceleration or, or some other variable? Um, we've addressed this in two ways. So the first way is to take the ramping activity within a track segment and fit it with a, a mixed model where we have position speed acceleration as coefficients. And in general, what we find here is that the the um, activity is either explained solely by position or by models that incorporate position conjunctively with either speed and or acceleration. Um, and when the, um, the best fit is conjunctive, um, position is nevertheless usually the dominant coefficient. So this did, does appear to be primarily a position um, code rather than a speed or acceleration code. Another approach to looking at um, whether this is position coding is to take trials um, when the animal runs through the reward zone without stopping. So this is um, population average running speed um, for uh, hit trials, trials when the animals slow down but don't quite stop, and trials when the animals run through the reward zone. And here, first of all, there are exemplar cells for each uh, trial type. And um, hopefully what's pretty clear for these cells is even on the run trials where the, um, the speed profile is completely different, the, um, the resetting of this activity is maintained. So suggesting that these um, activity profiles are really unlikely to be explained by, for example, speed dependence of the um, activity of these neurons. And the same thing happens uh, if we, or, or the same conclusion is supported by looking at population averages. So um, cells that we've classified as being position dependent either alone or in combination with acceleration and speed 
uh, maintain their running their profiles on each trial type, although um, one does see um, a, a sort of a subtle sort of modulation on the um, on, on the run through trials where we have speed as a coefficient in the model. When we have purely position dependent cells, then we we generally don't see this. Um, and, and then below we have the speed cells um, where certainly for the minus minus group here, you see a very striking um, speed modulation. Um, the speed modulation is in general pretty weak. So even though these come out significant, we, we, we might argue then that, that they're not really always um, striking speed dependent cells. Okay. so. Um, Another question is, are the reward zone cues important for ramping activity? So if interruption of the ramping activity represents readout of a memory for the reward location, um, then it should be maintained on trials when the queue is absent. Um, so we can, we can test this by comparing um, activity on each trial type. Um, here are examples um, for, for each of the groups of ramping activity. Um, in these examples, you see that the um, ramping activity is maintained even though the uh, reward cues and, and the reward are, are absent. So suggesting that once the animal has learned the task, it can read out a, a representation of its location um, that, that's driven by path integration and, and that correctly kind of resets at the reward, reward zone location. And this is true also um, in the population average. And most neurons maintain their classification um, between these uh, different trial types. Another question, is um, how do these uh, firing patterns relate to firing patterns in the open arena? Um, do, for example, ramping neurons correspond to grid cells or border cells or, or, or some other functional cell type? And this we can test by recording, first of all, in the location memory task, and then in the open field. Um, here are, again, exemplar neurons, um, um, two different uh, ramping trajectory patterns. And in general, these ramping neurons have a a spatially non-specific um, firing pattern. They don't in general correspond to um, any particular cell type, um, a, a border cell, a head direction cell, for example. They also don't have, um, one possibility is that these are, these are somehow sort of um, placey cells. They also don't in general appear like um, a, a place cell that could, that, that could nicely explain their firing pattern. Um, and, 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 and so this is, this sort of distribution of um, sort of spatially selective uh, cells is similar for, for each of the different categories of, of, of ramp neuron that we find. So this suggests a sort of very different way of thinking about uh, re representation or re re representing space in, in the retrohippocampal cortex. We wanted to know if this might be a general solution to uh, representing space. So one way to test this is to, um, here we build, it, build a uh, model recurrent neural network uh, which we train with a reinforcement learning algorithm um, while it carries out a similar task. And the, uh, the, the, the network can learn um, to solve the task um, pretty well. Um, this depends upon the um, initialization speed. Seed. Not every network um, learns, but when they do, um, that their performance is good. And when we look at, first of all, the behavior of the agent uh, that's controlled by the network, we see a very similar um, change from random stopping to highly spatially selective stopping, even on reward on pro trials. And when we look at the activity of the units in the recurrent network, again, we find the emergence of this sort of ramping um, like activity, which importantly resets again at the um, reward zone. Um, some of the details of the ramping activity differ. Um, I can go into this if anybody's interested later. Um, but I, I think the key thing here is that we see this very striking reset um, it, uh, at the uh, reward location. Okay, so um, to summarize here then, so we think that um, some retrohippocampal neurons encode reward locations through disruption of ramping activity. And we think this is driven by neural path, integration, path integrator and its interruption at the reward zone would reflect readout of a spatial memory. And these neurons are mostly distinct from classic grid border and head direction cells. And we can um, explain this activity or the emergence of this activity through a simple sort of toy model um, where we train a recurrent network to solve a similar um, location task. Um, this, I think, leaves open the question of sort of why employ these representations. Possibly um, they enable a very, a very dense code, which could be useful um, in, in, in some circumstances. And uh, possibly they enable the computations um, that, that easily read out distance. 
Um, our sort of motivation was to consider whether these cells might be downstream from grid cells. We, we don't have an answer to that. More generally, we don't have an answer, um, and we're really interested to find out um, how these cells fit in with the, the rest of this hippocampal network. So are they, for example, driven by the hippocampus, or are they instead perhaps driven by um, near, near cortical inputs? Okay, so I'd like to end there. Um, I'd like to thank in particular Sarah Tennant, who really has driven this work from the beginning. Um, Harry Clark, who played um, a very important role in the um, open arena experiments, and Ian Hawes, who um, has done the modeling experiments. And uh, thank you all for, for uh, your attention. Right, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. There are a couple of questions already coming. So the first question is, uh, does the distance from the start to the reward zone change? If not, is it possible that the mice count steps because it uh, would always be the same distance to the reward zone? Did you try uh, gain change to test that uh, they stop at where the reward zone was or counted uh, count steps? Yeah, so we've 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 um, tried gain changes, and um, the mice follow their motor commands. So they could be counting steps, which I think would be pretty interesting if a, if a mouse can do that. Um, they could be using some sort of motor efference copy. Um, we, we 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 can't really speculate on the mechanism that they use with these data. Our next question was. Do these cells actually cluster into these four classes? Because if you were to drive into four dynamical classes, whether meaningful or not, and then uh, take advantage traject ad average trajectories, you would necessarily to necessarily see you would necessarily see something like that. Are these are their cells in in between the classes or not fitting those classes? Right. Um, we haven't formally tried to cluster the cells. Um, whether they can happen by chance. So we, we, we've used a lot of different shuffled data sets to um, look at the, the, the frequency at which you would see these cells by chance. And they're extremely rare. So they're, they're unlikely to be a, a sort of a, a chance effect. Um, there do seem to be clear boundaries. Um, where it's a little bit unclear, um, it, it sometimes I think we might sort of lack the statistical power to see cells with relatively um, shallow ramping activity. Um, but, but our guess, although we haven't formally tested it, is that there are distinct distinct groups. I think Kevin had a question. Yes, nice presentation. So uh, I noticed many of these neurons that are ramping actually have quite a high Firing right. So, do you think some of them are interneurons? Yeah. So, this is a great question. So, we were puzzled because there's a pretty large proportion of neurons with higher firing rates during the task. When we record the same neurons in the open field, a lot of them have much lower firing rates. So, there actually seems to be a, a pretty decent proportion of neurons that elevate their firing rate in the in the task. Um, then there are a smaller proportion of neurons that still have a high firing rate in the open field. Um, and some of those do have ramping activity and they're almost exclusively neurons that have a negative slope um, ramp. Um, so, so it seems that there are some interneurons there. If we take these sort of criteria that are, you know, that, that, that they're not concrete, um, that, that then there'd be a mixture of some interneurons, but also the task seems to drive neurons to have higher firing rates. Thank you. All right, next question. Fascinating. I'm wondering if the uh, resetting factor is behavior reward, uh, reward expectation or salient location. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I, I think if it's reward expectation. So the, the um, reward expectation first, so that the firing rate profiles don't look like um, sort of striatal ramping cells in the sense that 
if you withhold reward or if you receive reward, you, you, you don't see the sort of effect of um, the sort of prediction error effects. So um, they're very different in that sense. Um, they, they obviously could still reflect expectation of the reward or expectation of the position. Um, I think we're more inclined to the position interpretation at the moment because the ramping continues after the reward um, as the animal approaches the end of the track. Um, and, and that also is different to, I think, to neurons in the striatum where ramping appears to be primarily in anticipation of a, of a reward. Um, so they would be my best answers at the moment. I, I think it's a good question. We could follow this up with more experiments. All right. Uh, yeah, I missed one question with three votes. So it was, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Are these uh, ramping cells entirely specific to learning? Do you see any ramping activity in the naive animals and then enhancement with learning? Or is it really a new pattern with, with, with the learning task? How much training is required before they emerge? Right. Um, so the behavior takes from probably five days to 21 days for a, a mouse to become sort of expert at the task. It's quite variable between mice. Um, we don't see the ramping when we've recorded in completely naive animals, but we haven't looked at this carefully enough. And one thing with this data set we're, we're conscious of is that we do move the tetrodes from day to day. So um, we, we, although we don't see ramping early in the experiment, it could be that the tetrodes aren't yet in the correct location. So we, we, we couldn't rule that out yet. Okay. Um, I think there is a follow-up question about this uh, clustering. My point though, is that the sum of um, up, ramp, up ramp and a down ramp is a flat line. Sure, it could be. Hmm. But it's, 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 um, well, I'm not quite sure the point. Maybe we could chat afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, I have one question. So I read from this bioarchive, and the location of the cells were quite, uh, there was a variability from where you saw these. So can you say something about uh, where, where they are and uh, how, how can they be many places? Yeah, we're, we're aiming sort of for the deep layers of the sort of intermediate to dorsal enterhinal cortex. Mm -hmm. um, we have a little bit of variability from experiment to experiment, which is why there are some sort of pre-parasubiculum neurons in the data set. Because we're aiming for the deep layers, I mean, we have relatively few grid cells in this data set, and I, I think that's also because we're um, in the in the deep layers. Um, does that answer the question? Sorry, I, I can't remember the second part. No, no, that was the question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So it's about time to move on. Um, thank you very much again, Matthew. It was uh, great. So the, uh, the last speaker of the session is uh, Nikolai Axmacher from Ru University Bochum. And the title is the, yeah, the rule of theta oscillations in hippo hippo human spatial navigation. Yeah, um, I knew Nikolai from um, University of Bochum where I was also studying. And uh, yeah, the sad thing was that he arrived and the same year or so I had to leave. <laughs> but uh, yeah, since then I know, I know well and uh, he's uh, very nice um, studies on path integration and Alzheimer's disease. So um, we wanted to invite him again for this uh, third iteration of iScan. And yeah, um, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind words and uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my presentation will differ a bit from the previous ones because I don't have any cellular data, I only have oscillation data. And then I also need to start with a disclaimer. So um, the title says that I will tell you what the role of theta oscillations in human spatial navigation is. So um, we are still struggling to find this out. So 
if you're not interested in uh, oscillations or if you have expected that I give you a definite answer, this is your chance to get an early dinner. Otherwise, I'm happy to, to share some, some thoughts and um, show you some, some data that we recently acquired. So uh, as you all know, and uh, as, as you know better than me, the rodent middle temporal lobe contains multiple different uh, theta, theta generators. Um, the entorhinal cortex, the hippocampus, and the medial septum um, all contribute to, to theta oscillations. Uh, in the human medial temporal lobe, the, um, there's uh, theta oscillations at at least two different frequencies, um, which uh, depend on uh, factors such as whether participants navigate in a real world uh, or in a virtual navigation environment. And it may also depend on whether uh, you record in the anterior or the posterior hippocampus, uh, where in the posterior hippocampus, the theta um, oscillations seem to, be, seem to depend more on spatial variables. In humans, um, I really believe it's still a little bit incon inconclusive which factors influence human theta power during spatial navigation, just because different studies reported um, inconsistent results. In some study studies, it was found that um, the actual location of a participant in a, in a virtual or real environment to a boundary uh, influences theta power. In other uh, studies, this was not found. Speed may or may not influence uh, the power of theta oscillations. The proximity of a, of a goal to which you navigate to boundaries um, may influence uh, the power of theta oscillations. The distance of your path to an upcoming goal uh, may influence uh, theta oscillations. And then, of course, all kinds of memory-related uh, factors, such as memory retrieval, but also subsequent memory effects, um, influence the power of theta oscillations. And I believe that this is still a, um, a non-comprehensive list. We are currently trying, uh, trying out um, the, the relative um, relevance of all of these uh, factors for uh, theta power. And uh, one speculative idea, which I would love to hear your thought about, thoughts about, is that there may be a stronger relationship actually of imagined or remembered variables than of the current um, state. Uh, for example, the, um, the actual location of a participant to a boundary um, for theta oscillations. Um, so in my talk, I would uh, I'd like to um, first uh, tell you a little bit uh, about one study where um, the theta power itself uh, was related to one factor of spatial navigation, um, and specifically where we found that uh, there was a hexadirectional modulation of theta power depending on movement um, direction, which has been labeled grid representations in other studies. And then I would like to summarize um, some findings from three studies where we found that theta oscillations organize the representations of specific contents. Uh, in one study, we found that goal-specific representations during spatial navigation were locked to specific theta phases. In another one, that item-specific representations during working memory maintenance were again locked to uh, theta, theta phases. And in a third study, that object representations during long-term memory retrieval showed uh, a very similar uh, theta phase dependence. OK, so uh, as we've heard um, already in, in previous presentations, and um, I guess uh, as uh, probably everyone in this conference here is well aware, uh, grid cells um, have been suggested to be a general, uh, to provide a general distance metric, although they also may re uh, respond to other factors, for example, rewards. And for grid cells, there's uh, six preferred directions. So the activity shows a hexadirectional uh, modulation. There's a variable scaling across grid cells in the uh, medial entorhinal cortex, but there seem to be some preferred direction um, across um, grid cells. And this is the basis, or this, this may be like one, uh, one necessary, though not sufficient condition for a macroscopic marker of grid cell activity, which has first described in fMRI by Christian Dollar at the time in New Burgess group, and has been labeled grid representations or grid cell-like representations. The additional um, prerequisites for grid representations are still not absolutely clear. So the link between grid cells on a single cell level and fMRI or network oscillation markers of grid cells are really, really not clear. 
um, there's at least three different um, scenarios how uh, single cell grid representations could give rise to uh, a single cell grid cell activity could, could, could give rise to grid representations. One is that um, what you're actually measuring by grid representations is not the activity of grid cells per se, but um, the activity of conjunctive grid by head direction cells. The second is that um, when you are um, moving along the uh, preferred direction of grid cells, um, the spacing of grid cells is uh, narrower than when you're moving um, a 30 degree offset. And if you have some um, degree of repetition suppression, the amount of activity at the network level may differ uh, depending on, the, um, on your uh, movement direction. And the third uh, hypothesis is that um, actually the, the activity of grid cells or uh, the phase of grid cells may not be totally uniformly distributed, but um, show some, some kind of um, preference for a specific uh, phase. And this, of course, uh, may also give rise to uh, grid cell uh, representations at a network level. So uh, which of these scenarios here, um, or if multiple of them are actually um, supporting the emergence of grid cell representations is, as far as I know, still, uh, still an unresolved issue. So here's the paradigm that we uh, used in two of the studies um, and that we also used to look at grid representations. It's a classical spatial learning task. The participants um, navigated through a virtual environment and had to uh, first um, encode the location of specific objects and they could use the landmark in the spatial environment as well as the uh, distal cues that were rendered at infinity um, to remember these uh, objects. There were eight objects in total, and obviously this is very hard at the beginning, but the participants were able to learn uh, across the uh, task. So in each retrieval trial, they first saw one object. They had to go to the location where they believed this object was placed, drop the object there, and then um, they received some feedback. So um, in um, in the form of a, uh, a smiley. And then, then they saw, saw actually the, the real location of the object. So they had some opportunity to re-encode the correct uh, location. Okay, so we did this um, paradigm here with epilepsy patients who were implanted in the anterior cortex. Um, uh, we had nine different, um, nine patients um, in, in the first study. And we found that uh, um, there was a very similar pattern to what has been described before at the fMRI level in uh, theta uh, oscillations between four and eight hertz, uh, not in any other location, also not at adjacent structures in the hippocampus and the amygdala. And interestingly, we found that this pattern was more pronounced um, in the borders in the middle part of the arena as compared to the middle and the inner part, which I guess may be related to reset of um, grid uh, representations by visual cues, as has been beautifully described in um, Lisa Giacomo's um, group in um, this paper in 2015 in Neuron. Um, at about uh, the same time when we published our study, um, it was uh, the an almost identical result was found by Josh Jacobs' group, um, where the participants didn't have to walk in the arena. They actually had some uh, virtual bicycles. The arena was not um, uh, spherical, but it was rectangular, but otherwise the result was, was very similar. Um, the grid representations here didn't occur at four to eight hertz, but five to eight hertz. But I think that's as close as, a, um, as, a, as an overlap um, as, you, as you could wish for. So in this study here, um, we found that enter on a theta power reflected properties of grid cells, namely the six fold rotational symmetry. We then reanalyzed the data um, in, a, uh, in, in another um, approach. And this, this was worked by uh, Lukas Kunz at that time, a, a postdoc in my group. So we didn't only look at the enteroanal cortex electrodes, but at all electrodes across the brain in um, 22 epilepsy patients. So there were more than 2,000 electrodes. And we tried to use pattern classification analysis to identify the uh, representations of the specific cues that were used in these environments. So importantly, we couldn't distinguish between the representations of the cues and the representations of their uh, locations because this was um, kept constant in the environment. So um, it's not exactly clear whether we decoded the, the cues themselves or the locations, but it seems that at least 
there were, there were at least some properties, um, some spatial properties in these representations because we found that representations of objects that were um, subjectively um, uh, more closely related were more distinct from one another. So there were, uh, there was um, the, the similarity, the pairwise similarities of these representations reflected some spatial uh, pattern here. And interestingly, it was the uh, subjective um, proximity um, of these object locations that was reflected in the um, similarity between these representations. We also looked at the brain regions um, that contributed to these representations and found that in particular areas in the um, medial prefrontal cortex and the lateral prefrontal cortex um, were uh, most relevant for these representations. So are these goal representations or Q or location representations, however you want to label it, uh, log two theta oscillations when the participants approach um, these um, locations? So we extracted theta oscillations in the hippocampus, hippocampi of those patients who had also hippocampal electrodes and specifically focused on those areas where we found significant um, theta oscillations that um, were above um, the one over F uh, spectrum of the EEG or the intracranial EEG in this case. We then correlated the activity during the um, time point when the cues were presented in a trial and the successive time points during which participants approached the goal. So we had one time course of Q to um, instantaneous moment uh, correlations. So some sliding representational similarity um, um, uh, result. And this could be related to the instantaneous hippocampal theta phases. So here's some result from individual trials of single participants. So we uh, could extract the hippocampal theta phases here, which is shown in these colors. And we could look at the, the ups and downs of the um, Q to, um, mm, uh, of the similarity between the Q and the activity pattern at successive um, goal stages. And throughout the participants, we found that the same goal representation, so um, trials in which the same goal was presented, um, the, these time courses uh, were highest at a similar theta phases, whereas for different goals, the uh, similarities um, were locked uh, over maximal at different theta phases. So this is another way to, to depict this here. So we found that the same goals were locked to the same theta phases across trials um, as compared to um, shuffled surrogates, whereas different goals were significantly locked to different uh, theta phases. And interestingly, this distinctiveness of the phases for the different goals correlated with behavioral performance. So in other words, those patients um, where, the, um, where different objects um, were re-emerged during very distinct theta phases showed a better performance than those um, participants where um, different objects occurred at, at similar theta phases. So taken together, we found that hippocampal theta oscillations seem to provide a metric for goal representations in spatial navigation. So now I would like to show you some results from a very different non-spatial navigation uh, experiment that uh, we did in collaboration with uh, Jing, Lui, uh, Jing Liu and Gui Xue at Beijing Normal University. Um, in which epilepsy patients did a uh, uh, delayed uh, matching to sample task. So in this task here, individual objects were shown together with Chinese words. The Chinese words remained on screen, but the objects disappeared. And afterwards, the participants saw either the same object or a different one. So a very classical working memory task for uh, individual objects. And again, we conducted representational similarity analysis across um, all electrodes um, in, in the brain and correlated activity during the moment when the, um, when the objects were presented and the successive periods during the maintenance interval. And we found that there were two periods uh, during encoding, one early period and one late period when activity during the Q presentation, during the object presentation was more similar during maintenance of the same object as compared to maintenance of a different object. For uh, what I should also mention is that um, the same object 
reappeared in multiple different encoding trials so that we could correlate activity during encoding uh, of one item and maintenance of the same item in different trials, avoiding any problems of autocorrelations in, in the same trials. Okay, so um, we also characterized um, the information content of these early and late encoding periods in greater degree, uh, in greater um, detail, and found that they corresponded to perceptual and semantic um, representations. But today, what I would like to show you is um, how these um, representations were related to, again, hippocampal theta phases. So we could again construct a time course of encoding to maintenance similarity and test how this related to hippocampal theta phases. And again, found that um, the same objects were, um, were repeatedly locked to similar theta phases, whereas different objects were, lo were looked, locked to different theta phases. So this was um, this was a, a like although it was a very different paradigm, it was a relatively similar result. Here we found that hippocampal theta oscillations provided a metric for item-specific representations during working memory maintenance. And now here's a, a final uh, study, which was done by Daniel Pacheco at that time with Paul Fashura in uh, Barcelona, in which he did uh, an experiment that combined a long-term memory task with uh, spatial navigation. So the participants could navigate in this virtual environment here and go to these red boxes. And once they reached each, each red box, they, um, they saw one, one object here. And there were two different conditions. In one condition, they could actually actively navigate around and um, decide uh, where to go and which object to explore. Um, and in another condition, in another block, they were passively exposed to the navigation path, path of a different participant. So this was a yoke design, which um, the like participants either actively encoded information or passively saw the movies of another participant um, who explored the environment. We found that as um, other studies before, the active learning condition improved the, the later memory, but since we again did this with uh, intracranial EEG, we could also look at the hippocampal theta oscillations and representations of individual objects. So first we found that in the active navigation condition, there was a significant increase, significant and selective increase of hippocampal theta oscillations as compared to the perceptually exactly matched uh, condition where the participants could not actively uh, navigate. We then again applied encoding retrieval similarity, so based on very similar um, representational similarity uh, metrics, and compared the correlation of, uh, um, of one item during encoding and the same item during retrieval with correlations of one item during encoding and a different item during retrieval. And um, then again, compared different conditions, the active and the passive condition found that the encoding retrieval similarity was higher in the active as compared to the passive condition. It was also higher when the participants could actively remember, uh, could successfully remember, remember an item than when they could uh, forget it. And there was also an interaction between these two factors. So um, the last uh, data point, which I think is interesting for, um, for the talk today is that we could again relate the um, activity uh, or the, the uh, similarity uh, pattern during retrieval with the ongoing um, hippocampal uh, theta phase uh, during retrieval. So during retrieval of one particular item, we looked at the, um, the encoding retrieval similarity uh, time course and how this uh, was um, related to ongoing hippocampal theta phases. We could construct some distribution of encoding retrieval similarities across hippocampal theta phases, and then compare pairs of trials in which similar items occurred, so semantically similar items, with pairs of trials in which very dissimilar items uh, occurred. And we again found some relationship in the um, semantic similarity of pairs of items and the uh, hippocampal theta phase during which these uh, representations occurred. Um, and there was again, similar to the first study, an inverse relationship. So pairs of trials with higher semantic similarity at a lower um, theta phase uh, similarity. And this result was um, selective um, for the active navigation condition. 
So um, the results of this study show that hippocampal theta oscillations provide a metric for item-specific representations also during long-term memory retrieval. So to uh, summarize, we found that um, hippocampal theta oscillations reflect various different internal and external states. So like uh, grid representations, but also active navigation and many other factors. We found that theta oscillations seem to provide a generalized metric for phase coding of different types of information depending on task demands. And my interpretation of, of these results altogether is that um, there may be some mixed selectivity of hippocampal theta phase coding. So depending on whether you need to maintain some, um, some specific uh, banana, for example, in shorter memory, or whether you need to remember an object that you've seen before, or, you, or whether you need to maintain a specific goal location, you can always use a similar theta uh, phase code um, for these different tasks. Um, obviously, these um, different conditions um, differ because uh, on the one hand, there's a representation of task variables depending on theta power. On the other hand, a representation that is relative to theta phases. And um, almost at the end, um, together with some other studies, um, I think this, these results may suggest that there may be some uh, multiplexed theta coding regimes. So um, I think all of us know that there's some phase amplitude coupling. So there's some uh, theta phase range during which gamma activity is higher in general and representations of specific variables seem to occur more prominently. What I show today is a second regime in which specific content specific representations are locked to specific theta phases. An even more flexible or dynamic regime would be one in which there's a flexible modulation of the preferred theta phases of a specific kind of information, as for example, during phase precession, when it's um, like the representations of one location can vary across the uh, theta cycle. Okay, so I would like to thank the members from my group uh, in, um, in reality and in virtual reality, and um, thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Nikolai. Um, okay, any um, question to Nikolai? So the speakers, you can also raise your hand um, with the system if you have questions. All right, then I, I, I have a question. I um had a little bit of difficulty understanding this phase stuff so, and at the end you talked about phase precession and the, the relation to your finding so so the locking of the representation what, what could you explain a little bit more um, again please sure yeah so th this was a little bit of a rush maybe so um so, I mean, the first regime means that uh, you have like phase amplitude coupling means that that you have theta oscillations and then um, something like gamma power uh, mm -hmm. or um, yeah. other activity types, which are always locked to a specific um, theta phase, independent of, of which kind of information is represented by, let's say, gamma bursts, for example. The second is that, um, that is the one that we found that um, the re-emergence of specific goal representations or the maintenance of a specific object during short-term memory always occurs at one specific theta um, phase. So for example, when you maintain um, uh, like uh, an apple that you need to navigate to in the virtual environment across trials, it's, it is always locked to let's say 120 degrees in the theta cycle. Um, uh, how, how I, what, what I didn't understand was how can you read out these representations so oh, quickly? Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, I wasn't clear about that. So, um, so actually, the, the representations were first defined during at the moment in time when the objects were presented. So, mm -hmm. um, during in the spatial navigation task, the participants at the beginning of each trial saw individual items, so an object, uh, an apple, a globe. Um, I think a baby bottle, whatever. Um, and then in this first study, we applied pattern classification on the distributed pattern when these objects were presented. Um, this was possible because every object was presented in 20 
two thirty trials. So this is like well suited for pattern classification analysis, where you can do a split half procedure, train a linear post support vector machine on half of the data, and apply it to the other half of the data. So basically, you define some pattern of activity across uh, electrodes in the brain that represents a given object, okay. and then you test whether this pattern of activity re-emerges spontaneously when the patients are not seeing the apple anymore or the globe or whatever, but actually approaching the, the location where this object belongs, right? So during the, the path uh, to the object. And uh, at any given instance, the um, like a specific object is, is reinstated more or less. And mm -hmm. then this, this gives this time course of um, reoccurrence of individual items. So one theory is that in phase precision, place cells phase process, and uh, sometimes it's more coding for the future or past, but in your locking mode, you, you don't see this kind of thing. It's Exactly. If, if you want to have like a, like a full 360 degree phase locking of mm -hmm. a phase precession, then um, you would not see um, maybe um, that that the apple always occurs um, mm. at a specific moment in time because like the like the the metric the reoccurrence metric that we are look, looking at is is um, is time invariant so it's across the entire uh, goal approach uh, period. Yeah, it's very interesting. There's one question: theta oscillations are also phase related phase related to forward and backward replay events, could the natural sequenceness of spatial navigation tasks play a role in your findings? Um, oh, hi, Christoph. <laughs> um, <laughs> natural sequenceness. Um, I think it would be very interesting to look at like replay of sequences. Um, so I, I don't really see how this could explain our findings because we, we only looked at individual objects in, um, in every trial. So uh, it's more like a reactivation um, or reinstatement than, than a replay of, of a sequence. Um, I mean, this would of course be different in other uh, conditions. So for example, in a, in a multi-item short-term memory task in which uh, like a series of items is uh, presented consecutively uh, or in which you look at, um, I don't know, encounters at, um, of, of a sequence of objects in spatial navigation. But um, yeah, I think in, in our, um, our task, I don't really see that. Okay, now another question. Could you see specific theta sequences uh, locked to certain representations? For example, coordinated phase precession across several neurons? Yeah, that, that would be very interesting to see. I mean, it's in some uh, paradigms, we are now recording single unit activity. Um, so that would allow us to, uh, to I believe, uh, address that question. So in, um, in the data that, that, that we have so far and that are presented today, we, we couldn't look at, uh, at individual neurons um, because um, yeah, it's, it's only macro electrodes that allow you to record uh, theta oscillations, but not, um, not specific. Um, not individual neurons. Hopefully next year. All right. Okay, yes, it's uh, about time. Thank you very much again. And this is the uh, yeah, end of the second session for today. And now it's uh, time for coffee break. So again, I encourage everyone to join the um, gather town for some nice chat. And then after that, we're going to have a uh, data bridge section session. So I hope everyone will be back at uh, 1830 German time in, uh, in 30 minutes, right? In 30 minutes. Yep. So again, thank you very much for everyone for joining the session. And uh, yeah, see you soon. <laughs>